We're ready to go. This is a crisis. crisis. This is no time for Donald Trump's record of hysterical xenophobia. Biden's son inked a billion dollar deal with a subsidiary of the Bank of China. Wait, 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 we're getting nervous, man. China is going to eat our lunch. Come on, man. They're not bad folks, folks. Since the outbreak, the Communist Party has been mobilizing overseas organizations to buy local supplies and send them to China. The growth of China is overwhelmingly in our interest. The beautiful history we wrote together. Banning all travel will not stop it. The president is right. The travel restriction on China, as every public health official we've talked to said, bought the country Hysterical time. Hysterical xenophobia. Germans. Xenophobia. Yeah. I complimented him on dealing with China. I'm not going nuts. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. The Trump campaign is now reaching voters online. You are seeing the president of the United States. Look at the lines. You join our movement. A lot of uh, President Trump supporters here. Greatest movement in the history of our country. President Trump stood up early on and said, let's stop the travel, save a lot of American lives. Coronavirus outbreak has only further exposed Joe Biden's weak leadership towards a communist nation. Because of the system we have, we've been able to ramp up and fight this virus, but that would not be there if Joe Biden were president because he'd create Medicare for all and destroy the research and innovation that we needed in this time, in this place. How refreshing to have a president who said, this is what I said I was gonna do, so I'm gonna do it. We need to fight back, we will fight back. We have an opportunity to fight for our freedom. And I can tell you the president was focused, laser focused on pressing back on China. We are one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. We will make America great again. Welcome. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. See, Take a look at my record, man. When I marched in the civil rights movement, I marched with tens of thousands of others. He had not actually marched during the civil rights movement and kept telling the story anyway. I came out of the civil rights movement. I was one of those guys that sat in and marched and all that stuff. Now, his aides went back to say, look, he was in office marching for the idea. That's not the word marching <laughs> me on Twitter. I was not out marching. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. They're gonna put you all back in chains. And you ain't black. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. You ain't black. You ain't black. You ain't black. You ain't black. The most racist thing a person could tell me is that I'm supposed to choose something based on my race. You ain't black. Hello and welcome to another edition of Team Trump Online's War Room Weekly, where we take a closer look at President Trump's excellent record of accomplishment on behalf of the American people and contrast that with Joe Biden's dismal record stretching back many decades and his terrible ideas for the future. I'm Tim Murtaugh. I'm the communications director for President Trump's reelection campaign, and we are joined today by two excellent guests from the halls of Congress to talk about a very important topic on the minds of a lot of Americans, the economy. Uh, which candidate among pre between President Trump and Joe Biden uh, has the record of economic excellence and which one has the best ideas for getting us back on track and getting America back to a place of prosperity? Joined today by Pennsylvania Congressman Dan Muser. Dan, Congressman Muser, thank you very much. Good to be with you. And also Congressman Kevin Brady from the great state of Texas. Congressman Brady, thank you for joining us. Good to see you, Tim. So let's just talk a, a little bit about uh, something that you guys are most familiar with, and that's what's going on in your own home districts. Congressman Muser, in, in Pennsylvania, what is it that you see economically in, in the wake of the coronavirus crisis, and what are people telling you back home? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I think the, the, 
The president, frankly, is rolling things out and handling things in the manner that makes sense for our economy, for small business, uh, for large business, for families. What the president is, is offering is a very inclusionary uh, process of taking in information from the private sector, uh, being very transparent, uh, every, doing everything on a data-based manner, having the task force with him, as we see at, at all times. Uh, and he's leaning forward. He's, he's trying to be creative. Uh, you know, he's, he's speaking calmly, but he's acting decisively. You know, it's almost like he walks, he would carry a big stick. I mean, that's how the president's handling things. And, and liberal governors, and I've seen the pattern, and our governor, uh, Tom Wolf in, in Pennsylvania, is, on, is opposite of that. He's on the wrong track. Uh, he's not being inclusionary at all. It, you know, it's, it's not an all of America approach that, that the president is taking. He's making decisions in isolation. And I was in business for 25 years. To me, the smartest person at the table making decisions on marketing or products or prices was those who talked to customers most. Right. We have a Governor Wolf who doesn't talk to anybody, doesn't talk to state legislators uh, uh, and made bad decisions from the very beginning. Uh, um, chose which businesses could stay open or which would close based based upon some new definition of life sustaining. Didn't even use the standard uh, essential labeling, uh, made everybody scramble, made businesses panic. Um, and uh, and then, frankly, didn't follow the data. We have over over 70 percent of the fatalities in Pennsylvania are in nursing homes. And so what we did is we put a high restrictive uh, uh, plan for those in low risk and and by order, by governor order, sent back those with corona back to the nursing homes because we were anticipating a surge in the hospitals, which never came in Pennsylvania. Our hospitals never got more than half capacity and many of them far, far less than that. Most of them still aren't open. So it's very, it's very unfortunate that a lot of bad judgment was, was used. They weren't listening to the people. They weren't following the data. They were looking at the data, but they were following, frankly, their liberal agenda. And, and, and the president, I got to hand it to him. Uh, he, he did things in, in an effective manner, a transparent manner. And then look at, the, look at the legislation we passed, the CARES Act. The CARES Act and, and Chairman Brady, you know, uh, was, was right in the middle of all of that. Uh, laying that out with, with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, a very balanced, effective, strong, well thought out plan for, for uh, putting, keeping people at work, helping small businesses, helping the hospitals, uh, driving um, uh, testing. You know, we, 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 really, we really did some very good things in those CARES Act. It wasn't perfect, but we'll correct it moving forward. But, um, you know, it's a, a tale of two cities. This, this time, uh, Washington had it right and too many states had it wrong. Yeah, I think you see in the, in the national news media coverage, there's a love affair going on with certain governors. And, and I'm thinking specifically of Governor Cuomo in New York. The media really seems to think that he can do no wrong. But then if you have you look at another state like Florida and Governor DeSantis has really been handling things excellently in, in the state of Florida. And he's just been lambasted by the media when, in fact, his record is good. And Cuomo's record in New York is really not so good. And uh, it, in Texas, uh, Congressman Brady, you, you have the good fortune of having a very strong, excellent Republican governor, Governor Abbott in Texas. Uh, tell us what, what your experience has been in Texas and specifically in your home district. Yeah, so it is <clears throat> one. This has been an unprecedented crisis uh, and it took an unprecedented response. And thanks to the president, uh, Congress has delivered the, the biggest rescue package in American history. We're seeing that work. And yes, uh, Governor Abbott, uh, to his credit, has been following President Trump's challenge uh, to continue the pressure on the virus, but to begin to reopen our economy and end these lockdowns in a safe, healthy way. We're seeing that in Texas. We're in the third week uh, of the reopening. Uh, phase two actually started uh, today. One, there is a huge difference in attitude. There is a light at the tunnel for workers, for our small businesses, <clears throat> just people in general. And uh, you can tell the difference economically. Uh, and secondly, we're showing that you can reopen safely. You know, our cases are up, but only because the governor is really focusing on testing some of these hot spots like prisons, senior centers, and in some other uh, uh, areas. But our infection rate 
is down uh, two thirds since its peak just a month ago. It's down 20% since we, we began reopening. Our hospitalizations dropped since we reopened. They have leveled out perfectly. And then finally, we are really fortunate because of the good work the governor, local leaders, our businesses, hospitals working together. Our fatality rate per capita is the best among the top 10 states that have uh, cases. For example, uh, New York uh, has a fatality rate of one for every about 870 New Yorkers. In Texas, our rate is one for every 23,000 Texans. So we are reopening safely, keeping the pressure obviously on the virus and the vulnerable, but getting people back to work. And I hope we can be a model for other states to do the same. Yeah, that, I mean, that's right in line. That's good news, <clears throat> right in line with uh, President Trump's optimism. And, you know, he's an optimistic guy. You guys both know him. And uh, he has seen a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and he knows that no one can look around at what is happening economically in this country and just think, oh, you know, this is OK. We can do this indefinitely. No, he knows that keeping, keeping the economy lying dormant for six or nine months or a year or 18 months in some cases people have talked about, that comes with its own health risks and its own, own health problems to have a dormant economy for an extended period of time. President Trump is the one whose policies built the economy up to unprecedented heights in the first place before it was artificially interrupted by the coronavirus, and he is clearly the one who can do it a second time. So let, let's hear from the president. Here's President Trump in his own words. There's no great win one way or the other, but I'll tell you where there is a win. We're gonna build a country. I did it once. Two months ago, we had the greatest economy in the history of the world, the best employment numbers we've ever had in history, right? I mean, everybody agrees. Even CNN agrees with that one. But I will say this, we're going to do it again, and that's what we're starting. And I view these last couple of days as the beginning. We're going to build the greatest economy in the world again, and it's going to happen pretty fast. So there you have the president of the United States. The president is a great optimist, and he knows the spirit of the American people, and there's no question that he built the economy up to great heights once, and he will do it a second time. And, you know, we get a lot of reporters uh, who ask us at the campaign, oh, because of the downturn in the economy uh, following the coronavirus, isn't isn't the campaign's economic message just shot to hell? And we say, well, no. In fact, on the contrary, it actually makes the economic message stronger because voters will be looking for a candidate who's got a record of building a strong economy. And that's President Trump, hands down, he'll do it a second time. Uh, Congressman Brady, that, that, uh, that seems to me to be a winning argument. The president did it once and he'll do it a second time. Yeah, in fact, it's more important than ever. And, and recall, you know, the President Trump took over a sluggish economy, paychecks were flat, uh, job growth was really slow, a lot of U.S. jobs moving overseas. He reversed all that with tax reform and just a good balanced regulation approach, lifting those burdens, he, he created the most uh, competitive economy on the planet. A millions more jobs, paychecks going up the fastest in the decade. It was going up faster for blue collar workers and the low income than others. We had the lowest unemployment for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asians, the, the best unemployment for women in history, women of color, we're winning the jobs race for the first time ever. Uh, we had more job openings than those working to fill it. And for the first time in who knows how long, U.S. manufacturing jobs flowing back to the United States, we were losing them under B Vice President Biden, gaining them a half a million under President Trump. So he has shown he can build the strongest economy in the planet. Joe Biden uh, has, has a record of failure. Uh, his his uh, economic uh, recovery was the slowest in uh, since World War II. Uh, his prescription, raising taxes on hardworking families, uh, raising taxes on Main Street businesses, uh, raising taxes on our businesses to the point we'll become, again, the highest tax country on the planet. That gives big openings to China, um, Russia, uh, Europe, and others. And what I guess I object the most at, that at a time where every dollar counts for families here in Texas, in my district, under Joe Biden, you know, those two teachers with two kids working hard every day, 
uh, they'll they'll be robbed of two thousand two hundred dollars a year from their paycheck. That is money they need, especially right now. So exactly right, President Trump. Given the contrast, you know he's proven he can do it, and Joe Biden has proven he can't. No, he, he certainly has proven that. And, and uh, Congressman Muser, in your your part of Pennsylvania, I used to work incidentally for Congress former Congressman Lou Barletta. Yes, so I'm pretty <clears> familiar friend. with with that part of Pennsylvania. And your district stretches from the Harrisburg area uh, all the way up in the, in the northeastern PA. And uh, what, tell tell me what uh, your your constituents experienced during the the great Trump economy and why they know that he is the president to continue that and get and get us back to that place again. Well, the president took an optimistic approach and he said what America can be. And he talked about accentuating our positives and mi mitigating our negatives. And he started with the uh, started with a lot of things. It started with the tax plan. He put the money back in people's pockets, which, of course, every economist will tell you that creates the multiplier effect. But it creates so much more than that. Consumer spending, consumer demand. People people have the money to spend and spend how they see fit versus the Obama-Biden plan of stimulus dollars being directed by a command central uh, federal government always being misallocated. I mean, not even, not even occasionally do they get it right. Of course it's going to be misallocated when it's being performed in, in, a, in an office in, in, in the Capitol. Ridiculous. So, so the, uh, the, the Trump tax cuts uh, were unbelievably meaningful. Uh, the um, you know the idea that they keep getting beat up upon by uh, by Democrats is just it's just nonsense empirically it's it's nonsense the results are nonsense and then follow that with all the regulatory reform energy independence trade deals we're doing all the right things I mean America was on on the verge of great great greatness all right not just not just being great. I mean, so great, we, have great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we have the best products, the best services. We can be the most competitive. We've got the best workforce. I mean, it's a big world out there. Uh, we uh, make it make an, uh, a fair fair trade deals with uh, with the rest of the world. And that was the president's goal from the beginning. It wasn't tariffs. It was it was zero percent tariffs. And and he and he was getting there with China and the USMCA and all. So. You know, we, we really could have have an incredible American decade ahead that would be beneficial to the entire world. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting past this, getting the other side of this uh, this crisis and, and getting to work. And what we need to do is we need to win back the House. I mean, clearly, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Speaker Pelosi, in all due respect, cannot be trusted to lead the House. We see the sort of bills that she thinks are best, quote unquote, for, I'm not going to say for America, but for her party. I mean, look at this phase four. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, but there was nothing in there that was in line with what the president or the Republican leadership or what's simply best for the American people. Transportation and infrastructure, right? Finding a, a vaccine as, as, as the president uh, is doing, improving upon the PPP, which was wildly successful plans for our children to get back to school. None of that was in there. Targeted uh, transportation infrastructure funding for the states. Not this crazy bailout pensions and uh, new federal election laws, basically HR1 in there, and, um, uh, and, and incredible waste and, and special interest. It was, it was wrong, but look, that, that's what they're about. That's, that's what they want. And it is not in the interest of the American people. No, it's not. None of those things are contained in this, in this the most recent giant bill are in, in the interest of the American people. And, and uh, most notably, I think, uh, are uh, direct payments to illegal immigrants contained in that bill, which is not looking out for American citizens first, quite clearly. But Joe Biden, right on cue, as he's uh, still running for president, maybe in some cases you wouldn't know it because he's been trapped in his basement for a long time. But he has reiterated over and over again, including just this week, that the very first thing that he would do if he became president of the United States, would be to repeal the Trump tax cuts. And that means raising taxes on the middle class and, in fact, on 90 percent of American taxpayers. And you don't have to take it from me. You can take it straight from Joe Biden. Let's have a look. Here's a hodgepodge. Come on, let's Would bold. you bring back the individual mandate? P pardon me? Would you bring back the individual yes. mandate? Yes, I bring back the individual you mandate. And I'm going to... That's why I'm going to double the capital gains rate to 40 percent what they should be paying. My positions are a hell of a lot closer to Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders on some of the economic positions.
Uh, and there you have it. You couldn't have it any more clearly illustrated. Joe Biden, you're not just talking about income taxes. He's talking about raising all kinds of taxes, reintroducing the individual mandate in Obamacare, which we know is a tax, uh, taxing, uh, raising tax rates on people's investments, which uh, hits more people than just millionaires, as Joe Biden would have you believe, and saying that he's more in tune with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren than anything else. Uh, if Joe Biden became president, that's that's what we have to look forward to. Gigantic tax, tax increases across the board. And, and Congressman Muser, let's start with you. What would that do to the taxpayers of Pennsylvania? First, I just want to say the president's work has really advanced Pennsylvania amazingly over the last three years, in spite, in spite of our very liberal governor's uh, policies. Fortunately, we had a general assembly to keep him in check. Joe Biden has said he will ban fracking. He's gone back and forth somewhat, but he said we'll ban fracking. That's 500,000 jobs, direct and indirect, right there. You know, we want to be, in all due respect, Chairman, uh, I, I like to say Pennsylvania is going to be the next Texas. And with somebody like Joe Biden, uh, maybe maybe uh, we'd, be, we'd be the next, uh, I'm not going to say communist China, but but close to it. All right, he wants to eliminate coal. He, um, he, he wants to really make our nation as a whole a sanctuary nation, right? Not just be favorable to sanctuary cities. Um, he, uh, you know, we're, we're a big Second Amendment state, as, as is Texas. He, he says he's going to uh, put uh, Beto O'Rourke in charge of gun control. Um, he's putting AOC as, as his chairperson for energy. Um, it's 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 enormously add um, uh, higher taxes to that, uh, and and the sort of uh, government that the Democrats believe in, highly highly uh, active from a regulatory standpoint. Um, a, a dark uh, a dark cloud will come over Pennsylvania again. And so you you brought up Beto O'Rourke. We'll we'll talk about uh, the uh, the energy things, but you bring up Beto O'Rourke and, and Congressman Brady. I don't want to hold you responsible for Beto since he is a, a fellow Texan <laughs> of, of of yours. But let's say let's say Joe Biden becomes president and he raises taxes. What what does that do to the businesses and and the great people of the great state of Texas? Yeah, as as you know, listen to what Joe Biden. One, it's devastating. Listen to what Joe Biden just said. He said, "I'm gonna." force Americans to buy health care they don't want and can't afford. That is a tax increase on the middle class. He said, I'm going to punish people who invest back into America and into the local economy. That will cost us millions of jobs as well as a country. He's going to give a tax windfall uh, to his millionaire friends in high tax states. Uh, he is going to um, raise taxes on American businesses to the highest level in the world, which means, unlike President Trump, who said, we're going to make sure American businesses can compete and win anywhere, Joe Biden is assuring us that we are going to export our jobs around the world like it was when he was president. That is bad news for every American. I don't care what party you're in. It is particularly bad news for small business people, and those who work for our U.S. manufacturing uh, 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 companies, because those jobs will be lost and those families will be hurt. We've got a lot of them in Texas. And so Joe Biden's prescriptions for the economy are really harmful. They are think harmful. Of the, go ahead, go ahead, Congressman. I was just going to say, think of the stock market crash that would occur with the idea of 40% capital gains tax on, on November 4th. Right. I mean, uh, with, with a Biden election and he doesn't think that matters to Main Street uh, America, to the families throughout Pennsylvania's ninth. I mean, they got their 401ks. They've got their pension plans. It's enormously important to them. Yeah, that's exactly right. He, he, he does not think, and uh, when he's talking and trying to appeal to the liberal base, he does not think about what, what impact it will have on, on regular people uh, across America and Pennsylvania and Texas included. And we, we have also talked uh, a little bit and touched on the energy issue, and you guys both come, come from big energy producing states, Pennsylvania and Texas. And we know exactly now how Joe Biden would approach those industries, the fossil fuel industries, oil, coal, and natural gas. Congressman Muser, you just, you just mentioned that. And and Joe Biden has appointed Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez 
uh, to be a co-chair of one of his climate change panels inside his campaign. And we also know that he has fully embraced the Green New Deal. And that means a death sentence for the natural gas industry, the coal industry, and the oil industry. And let's hear it straight from Joe Biden. This is how he would approach the job-producing industries that Pennsylvania and Texas and other states depend upon. Here's Joe Biden. Vice President Biden, I'd like to ask you, three consecutive American presidents have enjoyed stints of explosive economic growth due to a boom in oil and natural gas production. As president, would you be willing to sacrifice some of that growth, even knowing potentially that it could displace thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of blue collar workers in the interest of transitioning to that greener economy? The answer is yes. They, they want to do the same thing I want to do. They want to phase out fossil fuels and we're going to phase out fossil fuels. There you go. Now, if Joe Biden had his way, let's start with Congressman Brady in Texas, which uh, I, I am led to believe produces a lot of energy. What if Joe Biden had his way and got the Green New Deal enacted and he declared war on the oil industry and the energy industries generally? What would that do to Texas? Yeah, it's, it is a death sentence for jobs for really millions of Texans. And, and Joe Biden, um, look, there's not much difference between him and Bernie Sanders in AOC. In his most recent debate, uh, he said, look, I'm going to, to ban, stop drilling on American federal lands. I'm going to stop drilling offshore. I'm going to stop oil from drilling, period. For Texas families, again, millions of Texans uh, are dependent upon our traditional energy industry. It's important our national security, uh, America's energy independence, but for our families, uh, it's their livelihood. Uh, these are everyone from blue collar workers to those who don't have high school degrees, minorities, women, some of the smartest researchers, frankly, in the world, all in this industry, uh, who he, he is not phasing this out. This is an attack. Uh, and you, know, you think about as well, our schools, our communities, uh, our hospitals, all dependent upon a strong oil and natural gas uh, industry that Joe Biden is putting in the center of a target. And I still believe, look, um, this is the key. A good, strong oil and gas industry is a key to our energy independence. Uh, it's a key to, to economic growth. And by the way, this industry is one of the major drivers of the new technologies that actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So by attacking them, you're actually attacking some of the innovators and those who lead the technology that can address some of the environmental issues as well. It's just, it's frightening. Yeah, it is frightening. And, and Congressman Muser in Pennsylvania, we know that Joe Biden is going to campaign particularly when he's in Pennsylvania as uh, Scranton Joe. You know, he's, he's Joe Biden from Scranton, and he's right. going to walk around and act like he's blue-collar Joe, when at the same time he's got AOC helping run his climate change policy, and he is going to be absolutely pronouncing a death sentence for the natural gas industry and all of the 500,000 jobs that are involved with fracking in <coughs> Pennsylvania. We, we, we right. just can't let him get away with trying to be both things at once. No, we can't. The... Uh, the citizens of Pennsylvania and the voters are soon going to see, as we do, that Joe Biden is like an onion. The more you peel him back, the more you cry. Uh, he, um, he, if it were, if he were in charge, along with the uh, banning of fracking, we just installed a six billion dollar cracker plant in the western part of the state. We have a chance at, at another cracker plant in the eastern part. That certainly wouldn't have happened under the jurisdiction or oversight of, of Joe Biden. That creates manufacturing, not just a few manufacturing companies, a renaissance of manufacturing cracker plants create. And we've got opportunities for others. We've attracted many new manufacturing businesses because of our, our competitive uh, energy uh, rates. You know, in the past, most of it, 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, manufacturing companies were heading to Tennessee, to Alabama, of course, to Texas. Everybody was going to Texas. Uh, now they're staying in Pennsylvania because of our competitive tax rates, uh, or excuse me, our competitive energy rates. So, so that's been very, very meaningful to us. And let's just throw in how environmentally sound the um, natural gas is, right? We're the only industrialized nation in the world that has reduced our carbon emissions for the last two years. 
So we got a lot of good things happening. And uh, we, the United States cannot afford, Pennsylvania cannot afford uh, Joe Biden. No. And one of the things that Joe Biden uh, will point to, we know this, is that he will talk about the economic recovery that he helped oversee uh, when he was the vice president under President Obama. But we also know that that economic recovery was the slowest economic recovery since World War II. We hear that phrase an awful lot. So I think it's worthwhile to take a look at what does that actually mean? What does it mean that it was the slowest economic recovery since World War II? So <clears throat> coming up, this is, a, this is a fairly long piece of tape, about two and a half minutes, so I <clears throat> need everybody to stay with us here. This is an interview from Morning Joe from 2015, so well after Joe Biden uh, was into this supposed uh, economic recovery, uh, deep into it. And this is from Steve Ratner, who's not just any guy talking about this. He was the lead advisor on President Obama's task force on the auto industry, another thing that Joe Biden brags about all the time. This is a full and complete description of how anemic Joe Biden's economic recovery was. Just take a look at this. But I just want to put it in perspective and remind people how slow this recovery has been and how far we still have left to go. If you look at GDP, which is the, the sort of classic measure of the overall size of the economy, and this compares recoveries from six prior recessions going back to 1970, you can see that at 13 percent sort of overall growth in GDP, we're behind all these other all these other recoveries all the way going back to 1970. So we've come back, but we've not come back. Well as fast. It has a lot to do with the uh, depth of the, of the recession, the financial crisis, just the amount of wreckage that was out there. And it also, frankly, has to do with the fact that Congress hasn't done very much. Yes, we passed a, a stimulus bill back in 2009, but not much since then. And I do think Washington has a role to help. If you look so, at so why, why is Wall Street breaking records day in and day out? So, and this was a financial crisis on Wall Street. Why is it that Wall Street's not only caught up at doing better than ever, but Main Street's being left behind? It has a lot to do, in my view, with globalization and the, ability, and the fact that companies are extraordinarily profitable. Corporate profits are at record high record highs and so that's flowed to shareholders and that in turn makes stock prices go up and the average worker which I'll show you in just a second has been left behind all right let's go to chart two. so chart two on jobs and this is a little piece of the puzzle is that companies haven't been hiring as fast as they have during previous recoveries our total job count is up seven point six percent since the end of the recession we are doing better than we did in 2001 but again way behind all these other recoveries out there because companies are trying to remain lean and mean keep their profits high and have that flow down to the bottom line. But let me just show you the most dramatic chart, which really gets to your question of why this recovery, uh, how this recovery affects the average American. Yeah. So you can see in all these prior recessions, incomes, these are incomes after inflation, incomes all went up by something, in some cases 6%, 8%, a little bit less. But these last two, these last two recoveries, and particularly yeah. this one, wages for the average American have continued, continued to go down. Wow, that's tough. And when you have wages going down in a recovery, and you combine that with rising income inequality, which means the top 1% have gotten virtually all the income increases, right. which means everybody else, the average American, the typical American, is actually doing it, a it, lot worse it's, than it's those a, numbers. It's a, so there you have it, a complete takedown of what Joe Biden brags about. The economic recovery that he brags about was a disaster. And there you have it. You also hear the, the familiar phrase, the 1%. In Joe Biden's world, when he was VP, the 1% did okay in the recovery, and everybody else did not. Wages actually went down. And how is that? How could you even call that a recovery? So with a, with a final thought on this, that's, that's Joe Biden's legacy. legacy. Congressman, Congressman Muser, we just can't let that be. You know, you, you go back and you look at what socialist policies have done to countries over the years. That, that's exact recipe. It, it brings everybody down, the elite few it brings up. Uh, we need a, an inclusionary economy. I mean, this has been, the, the Trump boom has been a blue collar boom. And I love it. I love it because I represent a very blue collar area. And let's face it, most, most districts are just that. It's great Americans going to work appreciating uh, their, their job and appreciating their income and like owning their own property and their own homes and their own and their own cars. I mean, and, and the dignity of work. And, and that's where we need to go, not in the direction of the bigger government, the better uh, and, and all kinds of, of, of handouts. 
and, and, um, and dependency as opposed to independency. I mean, that's who we are. And so, uh, you know, I mean, this, this coming election is more than just a, a, a crossroads, as we say. I mean, it's, it's two different directions. We're either going to move forward and have fun doing it and be proud and make America as great as can be for the most number of Americans possible, or we are going to have a placeholder in there that's going to drag us down and we'll have uh, mediocrity at best. Yeah, that's exactly right. There could not be a clearer choice between President Trump and his record of economic accomplishment for Americans and Joe Biden, as we just saw, a complete takedown. Uh, Congressman Brady, uh, what, what do you think the choice means for your people in Texas between Trump and Biden? Yeah, it is a stark choice. So during the Obama-Biden uh, uh, White House, I led the Joint Economic Committee between the House and Senate. We had a front row seat uh, to their policies. Look, they, they um, inherited a tough economy, no question, but they led a miserable recovery. Again, the worst in President Obama's lifetime and Joe Biden's was their own recovery. Uh, we saw millions of jobs lost. Those paychecks, as I said, shrunk, you know, or just were stagnant. You know, every week, you know, a manufacturing plant would close. Joe Biden had an excuse. Every week we'd see a U.S. company move their headquarters, it felt like, overseas, and he had an excuse. And when, when Joe Biden and Barack Obama left office, most Americans still thought they were in a recession because that's how it felt for their family. President Trump turned all that around. I was really proud to share the Ways and Means Committee and lead the tax reform efforts. He knew what this country, and we knew what this country was capable of, Right now, you know, our top economic priority has to be those 39 million Americans who have lost their jobs temporarily. Our priority is to make sure they don't lose it permanently. That's why we're working to reopen the economy safely, to rebuild those workforces, to remake those businesses so they're safe and healthy for workers and customers in this lockdown. Given a choice between President Trump, who's already proven he can rebuild this economy. And Vice President Joe Biden, who's proven he can't, it is President Trump by a landslide. All right, we're going to have to leave it right there. I want to thank both of you, gentlemen, Congressman Brady from the great state of Texas and Congressman Muser from the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you both for joining us today. Very thank you. important. And I Chairman, it was great you. being with you. I'd, I'd rather see you out on the ball field, but, but this is uh, <laughs> just the same. We'll get back there, Dan. We'll get back here. Tim, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys very much. And before we go, I want to encourage all of our viewers to download the official Team Trump app. It's available in the App Store now. And with it, you can get all the straight real news from the Trump campaign. You can also volunteer, uh, learn how you can get involved in the campaign, make phone calls from the, from the comfort of your own home. And in doing all those things, you can earn points and turn those in for great prizes up to and including a picture of yourself with President Trump. So download the Trump app today. And I want to encourage you to join us next week on Team Trump Online's War Room Weekly. Until then, I'm Tim Murtaugh with the Trump campaign. Have a good week. My name's Joe Biden. I'm a Democratic candidate for the United States Senate. Trump Pop was a bad dude. Oh, my mama, Democrat. I'm not going nuts. He'd be the oldest president in American history. Are, Are you really? Churchill? All right, Chuck, thank you very much. Uh, it's Chris, I'm but Chris. anyway. It would put 720 million back in the workforce. We choose truth over facts. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of what we call Truth Over Facts. Today, we're examining the curious case of Sleepy Joe and, you know, the thing. Our investigation begins at a recent campaign stop in Texas. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the you know the thing. You know the thing. The thing. Was Mr. Biden, who had access to our nation's top secrets during his disgraceful eight years as vice president, trying to reveal state secrets? Some have suggested he was. You know the, you know the thing. Yeah, bro, I was the first to tweet that I know the truth about the thing. 
I've seen every national treasure over 87 times. He was snatching documents. He was... As it relates to the thing, I know exactly what he meant. Second Declaration of Independence. So we spent the last few days digging around in search of truth, truth over, over facts. facts. Thank you for sitting down with us. Let me ask, is there a second Declaration of Independence? So there you have it. Joe Biden, who often doesn't know what state he's in or that Margaret Thatcher is no longer the Prime Minister of Great Britain, has not, in fact, discovered a new Declaration of Independence. Join us next time when we will work with a renowned sketch artist who will reveal who or what is a lying dog-faced pony soldier. I guess I'm done, aren't I? <laughs>